Um, so my talk is, I think, located between something that Patrick Harris said and what I imagine Monty Lutz is going to be saying. Uh, and it, so it's picking up a theme of play. Um, I loved when, uh, when Patrick said, uh, we want people to play with us, because that's such a Facebooky kind of a thing to say. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> and I've been in marketing for uh, a long time, and, and, and from a time when the last thing you would say is, let's get playful here. Because it was all about you know, segmentation, targeting, positioning. It was all about the military metaphor. It was all about understanding the message we want to get across and then, and then dropping very large bombs on the island until the island was beaten into submission and said, OK, I get it. That's what, that's what TIDE stands for. And, and now we're in this, um, this environment, as the title of this module indicates, we're in this much more connected world. And, um, and uh, the, the, the uh, challenge is actually not to play, we all know how to play. The challenge is the managerial mindset. The challenge is to get people, and, and I think uh, you know, Patrick put it very well, recreate the brief process. Uh, that's probably at the heart of it. Uh, some of the things that, that, that I'm provoked to talk about here come from an attempt to uh, work with companies on, on native advertising and discovering that they just were not prepared to lighten up that they were bringing to this native advertising generation process the same mindset, the same set of understandings about how the briefing process works, the same understanding of, look, who's in charge here, that they had had in the era of, of television. Uh, I think a lot of people are watching Mad Men, not for entertainment, but as a, as a playbook. Um, and, and it gets in the way of what is required to, to make this, uh, this uh, century work. So um, let me start with a video. That, that will do. Um, <laughs> I'm sure many of you have seen this. Uh, it was actually produced in 2008, and yet um, it, it uh, continues to surface, particularly on Facebook, but on other uh, distributed media, um, and, and go through cycle after cycle of virality. Um, so between then and now, it's been seen by, by many millions of people. Some of the people who see it are uh, provoked at, or, or actually instigate the question, is this real or, or is it a hoax? And that leads people with more time on their hands than you or I to actually start looking for details by, uh, through which they can investigate. And one thing they'll notice is that the plane has a brand name on it, Killer Thrill, and so they'll go to the website um, and they'll uh, also see that the pilot, whose identity is disclosed later in the video, um, seems to have been born in 2008, has no prior existence, and um, his bio, which is extensive, um, is hosted by, the, uh, by a site who's registered in the name of the CEO of the company uh, Thrillerkill. So that leads to another wave of virality in which people are pleased to tell their friends that they know what, uh, whether, whether this is a hoax or not. And um, in the course of that, uh, about 10% of all video views seem to have led to visits to the website. The website is a, is a, is a marketer of extreme clothing in Germany. And I, I, don't, I can't tell you that it sold a lot of clothing. I can tell you the company is still in existence and seems to be doing very well. And that this CEO, a woman, by the way, because I think that's uh, why it's so adventurous, this, this approach to marketing is 
the epitome of playfulness. I mean, who in the Mad Men era would say, let's, uh, let, let's, let's make a media buy in which we're guaranteed that 90% of the people who see the, the media will never know who, that it, indeed, that it was an ad. Uh, but in a way, that's the point, because nobody wants to see an ad. And when ads came in blocks of eight in the middle of, of, um, of television shows, uh, they were treated as opportunities to go to the bathroom. They were, they, you know, it was so easy to evade the advertising. What this thing has done is it's turned the process on its head, and it's made the viewers want to find out whether it's an ad or not, and when it's an ad, what it's an ad for, and what are they trying to get me to do. So, um, so it's, what is it an example of? Is it an example of virality? I don't know, is, is, it, is it eyeball ha harvesting for, uh, for Facebook? Is it generating audiences that can later be used or can be used to deliver display advertising? Um, those are two earlier eras in, shall we call it, the, the academic's attempt to understand the world we are uh, moving into. And I think those two eras have been displaced by what you could call the BuzzFeed era, the native advertising era, in which publishers take on the job of disseminating virally uh, content that can be used to promote products. And that's the, the native advertising phenomenon. I think Duncan Watts has a terrific little piece and a lot of longer pieces uh, one in the Harvard Business Review on um, this new model, this uh, publisher-mediated model of virality. Um, but, but none of those are perfect explanation of this phenomenon because what is going on in this phenomenon, of course, is the teaser. It's the, it's the intriguing dimension that appeals to a small number of people and causes them to go off and try to find out uh, what's, what's going on. Um, and in that sense, uh, I'm, I'm really drawn to the word play to describe what's going on here. Um, and it was so, so nice to hear play introduced into the conference at an earlier stage because it is the, the word. And yet it's such a strange word. I mean, if, if you were designing a language, uh, would you invent a word play? Presumably, if the answer is yes, you would give it a meaning. But play seems to defy meaning. Play is a word that in a way exemplifies its own playfulness. So play, play is used, we can talk about um, uh, playing to win, uh, or we can talk about playing to idle away time, sort of the opposite. We can talk about play as a, as a, as a, um, a purposeful activity or as the opposite of a purposeful activity. Words are supposed to mean something, not themselves and the opposite of themselves. Um, you can play by the rules, or you can play in willful disregard of the rules. As you may know, the game of rugby was invented by disregarding the rule of, uh, of association football that you may not use your hands to carry the ball. So rule defiance is as much play as obedience to rule. Um, does, when we say we play with someone, do we mean we play the way children play together, happily, or so the myth goes, uh, happily and joyfully, uh, what a nursery school teacher once described as the happy hum that makes her feel her work is, 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 uh, is do, going well, or is playing with someone uh, a word for tricking them, for slyly confusing them into doing something they didn't uh, expect to do? In other words, is play adversarial or is it collaborative? And the answer is that for one reason or no another, this language, and I'm not sure about other languages, has chosen to have this word in its vocabulary to preserve all of these meanings. <coughs> And in, in exactly that way, with that kind, of, um, that kind of Rorschach appeal, I think it can stand to be the word that we put up uh, to managers when we talk about the right managerial mindset to have as we move into, into this, uh, this era. Um, the one thing that I, th or the three things I think we can, we can say about play I think we can say them, but the word has this habit of slipping away whenever I try to get a, a meaning for it, is play is generally a turn-taking activity. So it's encouraging the manager to think not about um, what I will do to the consumer, but what will be set up between me and the consumer interactively. And just as I'm failing to do here, if I don't get you talking, then I haven't played with you. 
You know, if, it, if there isn't a turn-taking function to the communication, the communication is not playful. Um, related to that is the idea of interaction and, and, and interaction without a, a specific uh, destination in mind. So as opposed to the notion of positioning, which knows exactly where it wants to get the consumer's head, as Trout and Reese once said, you know, the battle for the consumer's mind, is, that's not the metaphor anymore. It's this interaction that leads heaven knows where. And then thirdly, I would say play is always paradoxical. It always exploits the, um, the, the play between uh, what it appears to be doing and, and in a sense, what it's, what it's actually doing. Uh, Edward Ludwig, the uh, military strategist, wrote a book called Strategy in which he said on page one, because that's about as far as I usually get into books, he said, um, uh, the essence of strategy is paradox. And I think that's what's appealing about this, this era. Um, that, that, that we've been invited when we say to managers as they start to play a heavier role in the generation of their communicative content, we say to them, um, uh, I, I want you to, to leave space for, for, in your strategy for paradox, for the unexpected uh, turning out to be more productive than the expected. Um, so some, some examples of playing against, playing with, playing without purpose. Uh, we'll skip through that. Um, some of you will know, of course, about uh, dumb Starbucks. Uh, here's a LA Times report. With a line like this, you think people were waiting for the world's best coffee. Nope, it's dumb Starbucks. Word of the pop-up coffee shop is no secret thanks to social media. I wanted to try a coveted cup, but didn't have the time to spend in line. I asked customer Tessa Lacey what she thought of the coffee. A little watered down, um, not quite as bold as I prefer. Unfortunately for Tessa, she doesn't live in the neighborhood. I drove here from Santa Monica. <laughs> okay, so now the, um, the reveal. Um, Nathan, Nathan Fielder. Um, it'll start in Because we're operating under parity law which means as long as we're making fun of Starbucks, we are allowed to use their corporate identity. Starbucks has not contacted me personally, uh, but uh, they have uh, made statements through the press that I'm, you know, kind of disappointed with, you know, as a fan of Starbucks, you know, you know, I don't want to cause, you know, a, 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 you know, David or Goliath thing going on, but, I do want to say, if, if they keep the pressure up, they do risk losing me as a customer. The <laughs> <laughs> so, you, I mean, this is a, a, a hats off to, to Viacom. Of course, uh, Nathan Fielder is the star of a, of a Comedy Central show in which he plays a, a role that's all too close to my life, which is that he's a, an MBA consultant to businesses. And um, he's distinctive among consultants, or maybe not, by offering really, really bad advice. So he has invented the, uh, the idea of exploiting the parody law to apply it to anything. Rather than go build a brand, you borrow somebody else's brand and put the word dumb in front of it. Um, so what he's really doing is, is he's not you know, promoting a, a, a coffee shop. He's promoting a TV show and doing it in a way that becomes highly viral and, and, and that other people will pass along. So again, he's playing with his audience and playing with Starbucks and uh, just, of course he's a comedian, so perhaps that's tolerable. Pepsi Frito-Lay is not a comedian uh, and it came up with what I think it thought of as a, a very worthy communication uh, program called uh, Do Us A Flavor and it put up on its website a, um, uh, an interactive device in which you could choose the perfect flavor of Lay's potato chips. And the winner was wasabi cooked, uh, sorry, kettle cooked wasabi ginger. Um, and, and there's a picture of the winner and her congratulations. The point is that's not what the contest ended up standing for. Um, it was quickly displaced by um, all sorts of much more interesting flavors. <laughs> Uh, oranges and two, uh, uh, yeah, you, you can read them, right? And, and it just got worse and worse. Um, amber waves, waves of pain. <laughs> now, Bieber's downward spiral, I'm up for that. Um, crying while eating, the blood of my enemies. Fox News, can't we, can't we get behind that one? Um, repressed childhood memories. So, you know, it became a thing that people could interact with that would take it in directions that... Um, Frito-Lay had the, the good sense to say, 
these are working for us, and they have run this campaign now. I think, if, uh, I'm not completely sure I'm right on the facts here, but they seem to have run it three times, and I think they're more indulgent each time of where their consumers want to take it. Um, you, you probably saw this one, which was um, which, which it occurred when uh, when President Obama was the victim of a selfie. Um, it was quickly revealed that uh, that. Uh, uh, David Ortiz was in fact paid by Samsung to, uh, to, to take that selfie. So it wasn't a playful moment, it was an arch moment. And I, w what I take from this is, is sort of that play has its limits. And the last thing you want to do in play is be seen not to be playing, but to be uh, much too calculating. You don't want to be seen to actually be putting one over. Um, the people who are playing along with you. So um, the president got quite indignant about this. He's kind of apparently there's now a, a federal law uh, uh, ruling out the idea of taking selfies with the president. I, I'm not sure about that, but uh, but he's really trying to stamp out this this use of his um, of his, his celebrity to create celebrity for others. Now, the the the, the person who was probably quickest to realize the, the power of this marketing technique was. Um, was, was Rob Ford, the mayor of Toronto, um, who, <laughs> who was the subject of anybody who saw Rob Ford anywhere on the planet immediately got close to him and took a selfie. Uh, and that led to tremendous name, uh, brand name awareness for Rob Ford, not just in Toronto, but across the world. Of course, he had an unfortunate uh, health condition which got in the way of that, but others have, have seen the power of the technique. I want to draw the distinction between Ted Cruz and, uh, and Angela Merkel. Notice that Angela Merkel is acting as a magnet for other people's selfies, whereas Ted Cruz <laughs> has to take his own. <laughs> this, this is the difference between people playing along and you having to force them to play with you. Um, I, I can't resist talking about this because I, I find it completely inexplicable. Uh, Zolt, uh, um, Zolt, uh, uh, to, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm blocking on his name, and Miklos Sabri um, have written a case on, on the curious popularity of, Mer of, of Musk on Facebook. So Musk has 1.2 million followers. Now, Musk is probably the dullest built business in the world. It, it, it's a container shipment company. It ships containers. And yet 1.2 million people have chosen to, 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 to follow it on Facebook. Um, and... and Where's the play, you know, what's the play that's giving rise to that, uh, to that property? Why so many uh, subscribers on Twitter? Why 6.5 million uh, views across dozens of videos, some 200 p uh, views, but one with 1.4 million views, which is that? Well, that is the one uh, uh, showing the shipping of a giraffe. So Musk's involvement in this is, is not passive at all. Musk is, is trying to be uh, playful with, with people who Never thought they'd ever want to play with a container shipment company, but are discovering that you know there's some merit in doing that. So the 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 this, this was the subject of a film. It was it was uh, tracked around the world, um, and it, it contributed a lot to people who said something's going on here. I better I better uh, get involved. Um, one of the things they've done is create a, a um, contemporary equivalent of train spotting, which is container spotting. <laughs> It's marginally less exciting than train spotting. Um, <laughs> but these pictures all come from uh, the Facebook site where people are posting pictures that they have taken of Musk containers somewhere in the world. To what end? I have no idea. Um, but what has happened is when, when this happens, when, when, a, when a ship kills a whale, people sympathize with the shipper. Uh, I assume also with the whale, of course. But instead of treating the shipper as an evil party who goes around the ocean looking for whales that they can kill. They're now seen as, you know, as, as kind of the unfortunate victims of, of this practice. So the equity that they built up in the public, while it may not have had a commercial purpose, I doubt any of the 1.2 million people ever buy a container to ship something, um, it's nevertheless valuable to the, to the brand. Um, so I'm, I'm going to end with, uh, with an account of, of what happens when you don't, why it's a good idea to play uh, and not a good idea to uh, call in the lawyers. 
uh, anytime you hear a, a lawyer involved, you know no play is going on. <laughs> <laughs> so um, th this fellow in, in Vancouver, British Columbia, has created what he calls Pirate Joes. And what he does is every, every week he takes a, a, a truck across the border into uh, Bellingham, uh, Washington, and loads up at, at the local uh, Trader Joe's, brings the product back across the border. God knows what Customs thinks he's up to, but they let him through. And then he stocks a little store in uh, Vancouver uh, where he sells that product at a sufficient margin to keep himself in business. He's added a sign recently saying, Trader Joe's is not very happy with us. And the reason for that is that they have sued, and, uh, and they have lost, actually, in the first round of the, of the, of the legal dispute, because um, apparently you can do this. <laughs> you can, you know, tra trade Joe's does not sell in Canada, and that has created an opportunity, and people are willing to pay the premium on their products, and so he's, he's in business. Um, and it's going, going to another round of, of, of legal hearings. But if you think of what Musk would have done in this situation, or you think what, you know, what God knows Nathan Fiedler would have done with it, the opportunities for, uh, for, for humor are so much greater and so much more rewarding to the brand than whatever benefit they will get by closing down uh, this business in Canada. Not to mention the impact on the Trader Joe's in Bellingham, uh, Washington, which must be losing its best customer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was gonna end with, um, with Whole Foods' approach to, this, to, to a similar problem. This is the, um, well, it's, pale. it's really not, it doesn't get off to a good start, but I couldn't get the, the Yo, editing. Man. Yo, I know you've seen me here, dude. I've been waiting here like 10 minutes, man. No, 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 this is my parking space, man. Now, what you need to do is put your little hybrid in reverse and go out the way you came in. What? Yo, it's about to get real in the Whole Foods parking lot. It's getting real in the Whole Foods parking lot. I got my steel and you know it gets sparked a lot. I'm on my grind, homie. It's on my mind, homie. These fools with clipboards are looking at me like they know me. It's getting real in the Whole Foods parking lot. You know the deal with the little shopping carts they got. Check out what I say. It happens every day. It's how we live on the west side of L.A. So... <laughs> I was intrigued by this, so I called Whole Foods and I got the marketing, uh, head of marketing, who it turns out um, runs a very, very loose collaborative of, um, of marketing uh, VPs who essentially operate out of each of the stores and are responsible for the social media policies of each store. And he got involved in this one um, and has, in fact, this guy is now, or was, according to loose inference from the conversation, was on the payroll of... Um, of Whole Foods by the, by the, by the time this video got, got really big. In other words, Whole Foods is saying, if people want to make fun of us, that's part of the game. Let's just go with it, see where they take it, and, uh, and, and the result has been pretty good for, uh, for, um, for, for Whole Foods, which has a tough job given it's got a CEO who blogs uh, anonymously that you should buy his stock. So having a, a lighter and, and you know, more, more, uh, more spontaneous, more natural, more playful, uh, approach um, seems to work very well for the brand. So, you know, my, my wrap-up comments, and I see this, as I said, as just as really a, a, a scene setting between the hint that play matters and what I, uh, you know, what we'll, we'll see uh, developed in more, in more detail tomorrow is, in the next talk, is that, um, you know, marketing has been such a deliberate process in all the years that, that I've been with it. First you set goals, then you design campaigns to achieve them, but in this world, it pays to be a little more improvisational, to see what you're doing is much more of a, of a game. Uh, and and you know, take chances, do things that seem as if they might not work, because by and large, you can shut it down uh, if it's not going well, and, and you'll escape. And if even Musk can do it, then nobody, uh, except the Harvard Business School, can. can uh, <laughs> the dean does not find this talk entertaining. <laughs> um, okay, so that's it, thanks very much. <laughs>
I wonder how much of this work is actually on brand and on strategy. When you see JC Penny out there tweeting with mittens, like, you know, what are they? And, and I understand what they were trying to do is probably sell more Olympic mittens and that type of stuff. But there seems to be a lot of this jumping on the Twitter trends, the blue dress brown dress, black, you know, that whole thing. And then every week you get something from Ad Age or Ad Week that lists all the brands that did it best. And I just don't see the strategy. I mean, it just feels so outside of their brands. And how far can you take the play element of this where you start to go off strategy and off brand? Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful, um, I, I won't call it a question because I don't plan to answer it. Um, <laughs> um, it's a wonderful opening to a session with a therapist. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I, I don't mean that, uh, uh, you know, the way it sounds. What I mean is, I don't understand either. And, and, and the, the paper we wrote around some of these examples was called Beyond Bedlam, and it was a deliberate attempt by myself and, and a research associate to see if we could make sense. Because I had exactly your feeling, that, that this stuff, you know, I, we, in, the, in the course I taught on digital marketing, we, we had what we called the serious cases, and Vinit wrote one of the best of the serious cases, and then we had what my colleague called the wacky cases, and, and we had both. And, and I don't know, um, you know, I understood the serious cases, cases about what digital is doing to disrupt businesses, and I didn't exactly understand things like um, the JK wedding dance or um, the, um, the, 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 um, um, uh, you know, we had quite a number of these cases that dealt with these viral phenomena trying to understand where the virality was leading. U United Breaks Guitars was another one we looked at. All I can say that is at the end, I suspect that this is purposeful and that it is working. That in a Darwinian sense, uh, for some brands, it's developing a kind of equity that turns out, as we see in the, in the Musk case, to be something you can take to the bank when you need it. And when you behave like Trader Joe's does, I think you're behaving like a jerk in a playful environment, like a, like a drunk in a, in a comedy store. It, it, it pays to just play along, maybe. That's what I'm saying. And it, I, OK, um, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much.